has its own API, as some of y'all figured out when you're using you know, the Ubuntu versus the Max, uh, uh, Mac OS and, and the actual calls to change directories or to change make a or something like that. Uh, it's going to be different on each one of those file systems. Well, in the same way, the calls to, hey, write something to a disk or get something from a mouse. You know, I want to get a mouse clip from a mouse. There's going to be different APIs, right? And if every single device has its own API, well, that's so cool because you can now maximize the efficiency of that device. You can use all of the features on that device, um, but it makes it really, really tough on the operating system writers because now they've got to write code for every single device. So instead, we went with, with hey, let's do a standard um, interface, and then now I can, can talk to a SATA drive, or ID drive, or a SCSI drive, exactly the same way. Um, by the way, if anybody wants a little two minute presentation topic, um, we've talked a little bit about um, the AT, the ATA, the SATA, the IDE, the SCSI, um, so, you know, PCIe, uh, PCL. Um, so if anyone wants to just like do a five minute thing on something like that, just come up and see me and I can give you a list of like four or five topics and you can Wikipedia them, put together something and go from there. In any case, so we talked about standard devices, skip buffering for a bit. Uh, we've got some hard disks. So again, platters and cylinders and tracks on mine. Talked a little bit about, I'm gonna skip this. So, of course, as the things, platters or whatever cylinders are rotating, um, then we gotta move that head over to get to where we want to be. Once it gets there, we have to wait until the information we want comes underneath that head. So that's your seat time and your uh, latency time, rotation time. Um, once you get it, then you have to read. So you pretty much have three times. And that's the rotational delay, waiting for it to get around, the seat time, waiting ahead to get there, and then time to actually read the information you want. So uh, we mentioned that each of those um, uh, sectors on a track, and it tracks the whole circle, the sector is that little part of the circle, um, is potentially going to have the preamble, the actual data, and then some ECC, the error correcting codes, right? Um, and part of that preamble was the name of the track. Hey, I'm track five, I'm track seven. And you're like, well, it's right there. You know it's seven, right? Well, not necessarily. Because one of the things we talked about is, well, what if we skew things a little bit so that as I finish reading this one, I go back and say, read the next one. Of course, it's still spinning, so that I want to go to here so that it's where I want it. The information I want for the next record is actually under the head instead of having to wait for it to spin all the way around. And we'll actually see in about 10 minutes another reason we might want to put that uh, current track in the preamble. Okay, so we've got sector numbers. They can all be numbered all in a row, or we can start, start to skew them so that as the head moves, we're more efficient. You can not only skew them, but you can interleave them. So I'm going to do instead of one, two, three, four, I'm going to do one, and then two way over here, and then three way over here, and then four, five, six, so that it's spaced out around so that as you're reading your information, by the time you go from the, hey, read sector one, and then read sector two, you had enough time to spin so that sector uh, two is now directly underneath. Okay, so now it's a matter of, all right, so we've got stuff out there, we know we can read it, we know we can write it. I'm going to be getting random requests from various programs, uh, you know, I'm in a, um, a machine that does multi-threads. This thread may be reading file one, this thread may be reading file two. So I'm gonna be getting these random requests. I want track to sector this. I want uh, to read, you know, this other sector. And so each one of them may be on different tracks, they may be on different whatever. And so we've got all this, this queue of requests and we could just do it First in, first out. And you know, it'll be fair, but it won't necessarily be efficient. Because I may be going, oh, I'm gonna go all the way up here to read track one, and I'm gonna go all the way out here to read track zero or 99. So we've already looked at scheduling before. 
we've got all the shortest job first and all these kind of things. We've got the same kind of thing here, except instead of shortest job first, they may do the shortest seat time first. All right. Um, so we looked at how long does it take. We talked about the random organization. It's just, hey, we're just going to you know, put everything out, out there. It's like the worst possible case. There should be a benchmark by which we compare everything else. So the first one we looked at was first in, uh, first out. So we go ahead and as you, you know, get, hey, I want a job, what was it, 55, 58, 39, 18, 90. Okay, here's our list of jobs. Well, then we're going to sit here and we're going to go, okay, I was at 100 and I wanted 59. So I'm going to all the way back up to 59. Well, in 58, well, that's pretty close. And then 98, it's not, or, I don't know, 18, whatever that is, is not too far away. But then I've got these big, huge, long seats to get all the way back out of here. So it's fair because, hey, if you're the third person in, you're going to be the third person serviced, right? Um, but it may not be super efficient. As you can see, it takes all the way to time here in order to do those that one cube. Next one. Um, and of course, this also didn't take care of the priority, but we're not even going to talk about priority like this thing. Next one is um, shortest seat time first. So you can see the other one took all the way up to time here. This time, we're going to go ahead and reorder those things in the queue so that whatever the shortest seat time is. So let's go from the 99 to the 59 to the 58 to the 18 to the 25 to the whatever. And then I'll have one long seat and I'll do the three things that are way out there. Now, this one's really fast, but what's the problem with it? If you always go to the shortest seat time, you can start you can starve somebody. So this poor guy over here at 100 may never get access if you got a lot of seats, a lot of requests coming in in the 20s and 30s, right? This is, oh, 20s the closest, no, 30s the closest, 20s and 30, 20 and 30, and 100 is way too far. I'm going to keep, you know, staying here until 20 and 30s. All right, so to be a little more fair, we talked about the scan algorithm, and that is the, hey, I'm going to go one direction. If I'm here, I'm going up, I'm going to get all the ones that are up here, and then I'm going to get all the ones that are moving down there. So I start at the bottom, I go all the way to the top, do the top ones, and then go all the way to the bottom. It's also called the elevator algorithm. So it's the same kind of thing. If you've got people uh, say, hey, I'm on floor three and I want to go up, and I'm on floor five and I want to go up, and I'm on floor nine and I want to go down, then what it does is it says, okay, I'm going to capture this person, this person, and this person, and then I'll go all the way back. Um, in any case, uh, in scan, the, the arm basically only moves in one direction. So it's going to keep going and going and going until it uh, satisfies all of the outstanding requests in that direction. As soon as it finds the last request, then it stops going that direction and it starts going the other direction until it satisfies all the current requests. Okay. Um, problem is this one favors the tracks that are uh, near most out of those tracks. So to be a little bit more fair is what's called a C scan or circular scan. Okay. And what it says is, it says, hey. I'm going to go up if I, again, on the 10 floor elevator example, if the seventh floor is the top, uh, the highest current request, so I'm going to go all the way up, I'm going one direction, I'm getting floor three, I'm getting floor five, I'm getting floor seven, I'm going to continue going all the way up to the top floor before I go back down, okay? And so what that means is now, Earlier, when I was just going up and down and up and down, then I was closer to the middle more often than anything else. Now, since I go all the way up to the top floor and then all the way down to the bottom floor, then everybody's equally as likely, right? Okay. So it's more fair. Not quite as quick, but it's definitely more fair. So, again, it still restricts scanning to only one direction. When the last track's been visited in one direction, the arm returns all the way to the opposite end of the disk, and the scan begins again. Okay, so you go up all the way, come all the way back. Yeah. All right, so that's FIFO, shortest uh, seek first, scan, and C scan.
Now, did I make this one available to y'all or is this one still hidden? Assuming this one's still hidden, this one right here, or this one right here, would be the two, if you're gonna take a picture, these are the two that I would go ahead and take pictures of. Because you will need to know, there's gonna be at least one question, right? On the final for this, or at least I'm sorry, the next test for this. So you'll need to know, what's the difference? What's the advantage of FIFA? What's the advantage of FIFA? It's fair, right? Disadvantage is it's slow, right? Shortest track, uh, shortest seat time first. What's the advantage of that one? It's super fast. The disadvantage? Starvation. Scan? It's fast, maybe not as fast as short seat time, but it's also fair, okay? And then C-scan is, well, it's fairly fair, but it is probabilistically a little more likely to hit these guys. C-scan is it's completely fair. It's not just a little biased like the, the scan is. Questions on these? All right, so now we'll add a few more. Um, there's an in-step scan, okay? And that's the idea of, well, what if we have a service guarantee? I guarantee I will get, I will service you within the next six calls or something like that, okay? Um, maybe you're doing a real-time system. You know, you're flying a plane and the hydraulics, you know, the, they're controlling the, the flaps and things like that. Um, it says, hey, look, you have to go and double check the flaps and make sure they're doing what you want it to do every one hundredth of a second, okay? Or maybe you're flying a drone or something like that. Um, you can't say, oh, wait, I'm going to do LIFO and last in, first out. So I'm going to take a picture, I'm going to save this to the thing, and in the time it took to do all that, you're going to crash it, okay? That's not what you want. You have to have a guarantee I will check my altitude or my orientation or my speed guaranteed every 100th of a second. Well, in order to implement something like that, I mean, depending on how many requests you get in, with C-Scan or something like that, if the request comes in for, hey, I need to check my altitude or my uh, orientation, and I've got 30 other requests because I've been doing a lot of pictures or whatever, um, if we do that C scan, go all the way up and all the way back, and then we finally get down to this guy again, we're sort of sunk, right? So, one way to do that guaranteed request is to say, hey, um, I'm not going to look at every record. I'm just going to look at these, let's say, 20 records, or these 10 records. And then I'll use my C scan on just those 10 records. So, I'm guaranteed that I'm going to at least get these guys. Um, now, I'll still, you know, be fair, I'll be fast, and I'll add using C-scan, but I'm only going to look at these 10. And then, now I only look at these 10. And now I only look at these 10. Okay. Uh, F-scan is similar to that, um, but basically it has a set number of cues, okay? Now, oftentimes, F-scan, the end, the number of cues is two. So I've got my current things that I'm working on, and then I've got anything that comes in since then, okay? And the idea is that, you know, if I'm in the elevator, and I had a request for 4.3, for 4.5, for and 4.7, and so I said, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do them in this order, 3, 5, and 7, even though the request came in 7, 3, and 5. So that was the original order, I reordered this for well, three, five, and seven because I was at first floor and going up. Well, as I'm going up, all of a sudden I get a request for two and a request for four. Well, I'm going to go ahead and put those in the next queue. Okay, so I'm going to pass four two. I'm going to service three, five, seven. Once I've completed this queue, then I'll switch to make this the current queue. Okay, and these of course have been hopped off. 
Um, and then there's something else. So I'm, I'm going to down here. I'm going to service four. I'm going to service two. And if during that time, I also get a, an eight and a ten, then they're going to go back to the alternate queue. So it's not until this one's completely finished that we actually start doing that. So the old idea is, you know, the FIFO, it was fair because the order you came in is the order we did it. But it's not efficient. Well, this one has an advantage of the order that it comes in, okay, to some degree, you know, these, uh, the original ones came in first, so I'm going to do the three, five, seven first. I'm going to even skip two and four to do that so that these guys are fair. They didn't get starved. Seven didn't get starved because we came in three, and then two, and then four, and then five, and then you know, whatever. Um, so you don't have starvation. You have a little bit of the capability of the lipo fairness. You have a little bit of the, little bit of the speed of the C-scan. And there are other ones, but you, know, you get the idea. Of if you have this disk, and its head's going back and forth, and you have a whole bunch of requests for it, how do you make it efficient? How do you make it fair? Questions on those? Okay, so now we figured out how to efficiently uh, read and write stuff from the, the disk, right? Well, Murphy exists, you know, Bad things happen. You can end up with bad parts of the disk. We don't want to just throw the whole disk away because of one bad thing. Therefore, what do we do? Well, we can go ahead and mark it, right? Remember we talked about that preamble at the beginning? And we can go ahead and that preamble say, hey, this disk is bad. Now, one of the things you can do is, I mean, sometimes there's just a piece of dust in it. So you go out there, you read it, you check your ECC code, and if it is something that's just like a single bit, bit gut swap, some of the more complex ECC codes aren't just error checking, but error checking and correcting. They can actually fix it right there. So as you read it, you go, you figure, oh, okay, you did this nice little calculation. I know that bit's wrong, boom, we're done. Well, if you go out there and maybe two or three bits got messed, messed up and the ECC can't handle it, well, then you go, well, what do I do? What option is this? Try again. Maybe it was just a temporary power surge. Maybe it was just a piece of dust. You go out there and you try it again. You read it in and this time it works. Hey, cool. Maybe you try it three times. But if it fails three times in a row in such a way that your ECC cannot fix it, then we're going to go ahead and mark that sector as bad, right? Now, uh, so what do we do now? Well, one way is to go ahead and say, when we're formatting our disk, we're going to go ahead and say, we have the capability um, for 31, or 32 actually, sectors. We're not going to format all of them. We're going to leave two of them as spares. Okay? So now we go up there, we start reading, everything's great. After six months or a year, we read sector seven, the ECC fails, um, and we have to mark this as bad. So we're going to go ahead and say, all right, number seven is bad sector. Great. Now what do we do? Okay. Let's assume we can get that sector from somewhere else. We'll figure out how to do that in a minute. We'll talk about the rating. But assuming we have the data for seven, where, where do we put it? Well, we could just put it back over here um, in our first spare. And now things are out of order, right? So we've got one, two, three, four, oh, seven. Yeah, seven's way over here. Well, if you want them in order, what could you do? That's one way to do it. So the link list kind of thing. Or you can go back and brute force it and say, all right, I'm going to move everything down. I'm going to shift eight all the way to 29 down, and I'll put seven right back there. So we could keep it in order, right? But does that seem efficient? Okay. So more often than not, we'll just go ahead and put it over there, and we've got a little list that says, hey, here's the next sector, here's the next sector, right? So you're 
file system has to take care of that, right? So you can't just assume, oh, all I have to do is give you the first address, the first sector of the file, and the length of the file, and that's enough information, right? So instead, you have to end up having all these inodes and, and such. It says, oh, well, here's the first one, here's the next one, here's the next one. So that you can go ahead and take care of things like this, where bad sectors, or where sectors are bad. Yes. Um, so whenever we're moving it, it's like instead of the bad sector, it's like we're going to copy it and put it in uh, in query. Mm -hmm. So like, could we like eventually copy like bad data or like corrupted data and store it in the very spot? You could, but we wouldn't want to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So in about six slides, we're going to go ahead and say, well, how do we get the right data so we're not copying the correct data? That's the whole idea of the way. All right, so again, sometimes go go to DCC, it'll fix it. Sometimes you just rewrite it. Um, sometimes you have to go ahead and swap to a, you know, mark this one as bad and put everything over in a new sector. Uh, so, who takes care of that table? Who takes care of marking things? Who takes care of you know, copying stuff over? Obviously, you could do it um, in the operating system. So it's the operating system that's taking care of all this. Or you can delegate it down to the disk controller, right? Because again, all your devices um, these days are pretty smart. You know, they don't just have a uh, uh, you know the send a command and say, "Hey, do this." It's going to have potentially a cache. It's going to have maybe even a CPU so you can give it program.io. So you can say, hey, I want you to do this, and read this, and do this. It may even have uh, microcode on it so that it knows, oh, I know how to do ECCs. I know how to mark sectors as bad. I know how to do this linked list. It's all in the uh, device itself. Okay. So again, you sort of have to decide how you want to do that. Uh, so, if you have those bad lists, or a list of bad sectors, obviously you could go ahead and say, um, we're gonna have a, a list, right? And so I have a list of all the bad sectors, just like I have a list of all the sectors that are used, and a list of all the sectors that are free. Um, you could just have a single file. Hey, here's my file of bad sectors. And every time you find a new sector, you just add that sector to the list of sectors in that file. Okay. Um, and then you never let anybody see that file. So nobody can actually read that file, nobody can write to that file. It's just a system file and it takes care of everything. Um, and again, when you're doing your backups, um, you're not going to want those sectors ever backed up. Um. Okay. Um, obviously, this scares occur. We can't always fix all the problems. Um, so what we really, really want is to try and have stable storage. So you know when you write something and then go to read it, it's going to read back the exact same thing. Um, now, you're never going to have a perfect environment, and therefore, what do we have? What should you be doing? When was the last time y'all did a backup? Oh, come on, guys. Y'all are computer scientists, right? You're doing backups of your disks. Please. Please. That's not <laughs> All the important data, right? <laughs> um, because stuff goes back. I mean, now, hopefully the operating system, hopefully the firmware is going to take care of most of these things. But bad stuff does happen. All right, and including, we just have power values, right? So if I'm right in the middle of a write, and the power goes bad, what, what do we do, okay? So as an operating system writer, how do you deal with the um, possibility of, let's say, power step uh, values? Uh, so one thing is, well, where did the power failure happen, right? So let's say 
can you take a to write something? And again, are you all familiar with the RAID technology at all? Yeah. Basically, what if you had two identical disks, okay? And so you have two one terabyte disks. Now, the operating system knows about both of them. The user thinks there's virtually one disk, a single terabyte disk. He doesn't know it's actually two disks, right? So every time you write to one disk, you also write to the other disk. Okay, so you have a duplicate copy. Now, the chances that sector 27 on this disk goes bad at the exact same time as sector 27 on that disk is probably pretty low, right? So if you ever have an error on this disk, you know, like that, hey, bad sector on seven, then you just go to the other disk, the copy, get its copy of seven, and move it over to the new space. Does that make sense? So basically, RAID 1, and there's several level, levels of RAID, is you just have two completely independent disks, and you copy to both of them, okay? So if for a stable write, you know, the stable system, you always write under the first drive, okay? And how do you know if what you wrote actually was valid? Yeah. If I write the number 42 to my drive number one, how do I know it got there? You read it. You're reading. So when you do the write, you immediately do a read to make sure the value's the same, right? And if it's not, hey, that's potentially a bad sector. So I'm going to write it and read it again. I'm going to write it and read it again. Now, you think we're doing this at the CPU level? Is that efficient? So what are we probably doing this at? The disk controller level, right? Every time there's a write, it writes, then it reads and makes sure that everything's good. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and write a block of data on the one. I reread it to verify it. If I can't, I'm going to write it again. After n attempts, if I try to write it, read it, write it, read it, write it, read it six times, then I'm going to say, that's a bad sector. We're going to stop. We're, uh, we're going to mark it as bad. We're going to do another sector. I'm going to write it, read it, hopefully it's good, right? As soon as I'm absolutely confident that it is written properly, 42 is on this one, then I can go ahead and do the same thing to this two, right? I write it, I read it, if everything's good, I'm done. It's not, I'll try it up again times, market is bad, go to another sector, read and write it until it's good. That way you have a guarantee that this is gonna work, okay? Same kind of thing, when I'm doing a read, I'm gonna go ahead and read it from disk one, I'm gonna check a TCC, um, if it's good, great, we're gonna go on, if it's wrong, I'm gonna read it again, read it again, read it again, just in case it was a fluctuation, you know, temporal kind of thing. Um, if uh, I finally get it, now I'm going to read it from this two, and I'm going to compare those values. If those values aren't right, then I'm going to say, hey, there's a problem. So now, what happens if we crash? So maybe I'm in the middle of a read. If I crash in the middle of a read, do I care? Not really. I mean, I come back up, the information is still out there, I just reboot my process and I read it again. The problem is, what if I crash in the middle of a write? Okay. So, here's what we're going to do. It sort of depends on when did we crash. Okay. Well, if we were about to write, but we crashed before we did the write, then this one and this two both have the old value, we're still okay, right? But if we crashed in the middle of a write, then we're going to get an ECC error from one, and what's going to happen? When we come back up, it's going to have an ECC error. We know it's an error. We know one is wrong. So what do we do? We copy two over one, right? Well, what if we crash between the new and the old? What do we have to do? We compare them. They're wrong. Okay, we look at the dates of the writes, and we know a crash occurred, we're trying to recover from the crash, we see there's a difference between this block, this sector, and this sector, 
This one was written before the crash, okay? So all we have to do is what? We just copy the new value of the old value. Well, if we're crash in the middle of writing two, what's gonna happen with this one? It's gonna have an ECC error. We simply copy from one to two. And if it crashes after, we don't care, right? The write was successful. So by having these two disks, we can pretty much, um, and a little bit of code that checks ECCs and copies things over, um, we can recover not only from reads, but also from writes. Does that make sense? All right. Da, da, da. All right, so we can scan both this, we can compare uh, blocks, if everything's good, great. If one of them has an ECC error, copy from the good to the bad. If both of them are good, but have different dates or data, then we copy appropriately. All right, um, so because of this, a whole scan of the disk can rebuild the data after a crash. Unfortunately, this is expensive, right? So, what technique have we seen before when something's expensive? When we're talking the same memory. Put it in the cache, right? So, obviously, the same kind of thing. What if we kept a list of the block we were currently writing, okay? Then we wouldn't have to look at the whole disk because we know, oh, we're writing this block right here. We don't have to check this block. So a lot of times what they'll do is they'll have a non-volatile RAM, okay? And, um, you know, it's a, it's a flash or something like that. So it keeps, hey, this is the track I was reading and this is the data I was writing to it, or at least this was the, the sector I was writing. Um, if it goes down and comes back up, then, hey, I know what I was currently writing. I only have to worry about that one track, right? So now, during recovery, only the current blocks being written are affected. So you look at those values, you restore them and both of them. Um, now, one of the things they'll often do, how many people use their hard drive at three o'clock in the morning? Okay, a few, right? Uh, for most businesses, um, they can go ahead and find a time where, hey, for this two hour block of time, we don't expect anybody to be using things, we're just gonna do regular maintenance. I'm just gonna do a full uh, F this, you know, a check on my disk and make sure everything's good. So, that's that. All right. So now that we've gone through a lot of that, now we can go back and hit the things that I had to skip because until you know some of these things, the other stuff just doesn't make sense. All right. Um, so again, DMA transfer. You could have the CPU doing all of this work we've talked about. Yes. Okay. So like I said, we could have the CPU doing all this work. That seems inefficient. So let's go ahead and dump it over to the DMA control. Or let's dump it over to the disk control, right? And again, the DMA controller is a little bitty CPU that says, hey, I know how to pull things in and out of memory. I know how to pull things uh, onto a disk or onto whatever. Uh, same kind of thing. We can even go further down. We can have disk controllers. Those disk controllers can have buffers. They can have those that volatile mem memory so it knows, aha, this is the block that was currently being read. So if I crash, I come back up. I can check that one. All right, so we've got three options here. We could go ahead and say, all right, the CPU is in charge of all I.O. operations, okay? And we know that I.O. operations are really slow compared to CPU. So we would be doing a CPU, CPU, CPU. Now, we've got to do an I.O., so I'm just gonna wait, 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 wait. Very efficient, right? Now the programmed I.O. instead says, hey, um, I'm gonna grab an I.O. device, I'm gonna send this information into a buffer, and here are the instructions I need 
to you to do. And so that like DMA or whatever is going to go ahead and say, all right, I'm going to read through those instructions. I'm going to do them. When I'm done, I come back. Uh, so that's going to be something like this. So you've got your user. The user says, hey, print A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Um, when they say go, it actually sits down into the kernel. The kernel, or maybe a device control or a DMA or somebody, something other than the kernel CPU process, says, okay, now I have a pointer to next. And I can say, okay, now I'm going to send an A over, and then I'm going to send a B over, and then I'm going to send a C over. And while it's doing that, the CPU is now released to do whatever it wants to do. It can pull another process in, you know, swap out, do something else that's CPU bound, and eventually it'll get the, hey, we're done, right? Uh, so again, an example would be something like this. So we're copying from the user everything uh, into the buffer. We've got our count, how big it is. So now we go from zero to count. We go ahead and say, hey, as long as the status um, is not ready, we're going to wait, 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 wait. Finally, it's ready. Then we start pushing this up over. Questions on that one? Interrupt driven is a little bit different because, see, at this point, we were still saying, hey, we copy, copy things and then while we're waiting on that buffer, we're spinning and wasting cycles, right? Instead, you just simply say, hey, here's the stuff, go for it. And then whenever it's done, it then sends the interrupt, okay? Now, of course, when it sends that interrupt, the scheduler says, okay, hey, I'm going to do that interrupt. It pops down there. Whatever that code was to handle interrupts, it goes ahead and executes that code and then pops back. Um, so now you've got your other process. Which do you think is faster? The program interrupt, I mean, the program I.O. or the interrupt driven? Which one's going to have a better CPU utilization? What? The interruptible? The idea is, hey, we've got process A, and it's doing this thing. All of a sudden, hey, I've got to use my O. So it dumps something up here to something else. It's going to go ahead and do all those instructions, right? And then it comes back. Um, so if this guy is in charge of it, it has to wait the CPU to do something. So we're actually uh, doing process work, process work, process work. Now we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. And then finally, we can start doing stuff at the end. And the other option, we've got your interrupt. So we do our programming, programming, programming. We swap down. This is going to do things. So now we can go from process P to, say, process R. Okay. It's finally done, and we swap back to process P again. So the idea is here we're going to be a lot more efficient, right? So while we're waiting on things, it's going ahead and doing its processing. We can go to uh, process R, and then go back to process uh, go to process R, and then go back to process P. The problem is this assumes your I/O is long, right? What's what happens if instead we have really really short I/O? Say our IO is only that big. I'm just getting one key, one keystroke from the, the keyboard. I'm just getting one mouse move. Well, how much time does it take to save this guy's state to go out to the ready queue, figure out what the next process is, pull that whole process in, start it up, okay, and then get oh hey interrupt I'm done I got my one character. Oh, okay, well let me swap P or R back out, save its state, pull P back in, set it back up, and go again. So believe it or not, this, hey, I'm just gonna do it myself, works really well if you have really fast I.O. Because, hey, I waited one, let's say one or two time cycles, and then I was immediately going back into it. So it sort of depends um, on how long your I.O. is as to whether you want to go ahead and do interrupt-driven or 
uh, PI. Does that make sense? Now, in general, reading files from disks, that's a long time, right? And I gave the example of the keyboard one character because it's just one character, right? But we've already seen one character on the keyboard is really, really slow, right? It's like one-tenth of a second. So that's probably not the best example. But maybe you're going to go ahead and set some status um, on a hard drive or whatever, or uh, even better, maybe in a uh, solid-state device. You're going to go ahead and set one bit on a solid-state device. Well, that's going to be blindingly fast, so it's not worth saving the whole state out to that same SSD and bringing the new state back in. So you just have to, you have to look at the benefits as to whether interrupt driven or programmed I.O. is actually going to be better. All right, uh, memory address. Um, again, this is the idea of you have a logical area in memory, okay? So I'm going to say address FFFF00 all the way up to FFFF. Um, those are my devices, okay? Or maybe that's my printer device. And so now I can just write out to memory, okay? I'm going to write out to FFFF00 the first character, FFFF01, 02. I just write it out to memory, okay? And then that memory, which doesn't physically exist, then gets mapped down to, oh, that's actually a read out to the, um, the hard drive. Or that's a uh, uh, read from the keyboard or read from the mouse. Okay. And in this case, that's direct memory access. So all you do is you say, hey, I cop copy it to the buffer, I copy it to this area, and then go. And it's up to the DMA controller to take that logical um, memory and then actually put it out to the physical device. And again, you typically um, put your buffer out there, you set up the DMA controller, hey, this is the, this, you know, this should be going to the uh, printer, or this should be coming from the keyboard, and then say, go, you hit the scheduler. And then whenever it does its thing, it's gonna go ahead and unblock the user and return it back. Okay, so, as far as the operating system is concerned, up here at the user level, you get an I/O request. It's going to go ahead and send it down to the device-independent software. Remember that standard um, interfaces, our, you know, our three standard interfaces. Well, those standard interfaces actually have to be implemented on the real device drivers. Okay, so those device drivers will then um, implement that standard uh, device-independent software. Uh, so now we go ahead and we set up our whatever it is, uh, the DMA or the um, uh, PIO or the controller. Eventually, you're going to have potentially interrupt handlers, so they're going to know what to do. Then hardware, hardware actually does what it's going to do, and it pops back up and says, hey, it's been done. Interrupt handler says, okay, got it. Then it sends up the device driver. The device driver says, oh, we had a, a good a successful event, or we had an error, then we pop that up to the device independent, and then finally back up to the device. So, lots of different layers in there, but that means at each layer, it's a lot easier to deal with, right? We've encapsulated, we've abstracted, um, <coughs> making each successive layer uh, have to deal with less and less. All right. Um, All right, so this is that whole, even though each device may have something different, um, we're gonna have that standard interface, and that standard interface then implements the actual um, real interface using device drivers. That's why there's so many device drivers out there. I think I saw something that said like 70% of the code in your operating system is just device drivers. If you think about it again, how many keyboards are out there, how many mice are out there, how many different monitors are out there. And they each have individual settings and you have to have a device driver for that device. All right. Um, 
buffering. As we said earlier, um, your CPU may be able to throw things out there faster than the disk can write, right? And you don't want to necessarily have it wait the whole time so you can throw it into a buffer. Now, if you throw too much into a buffer, you have buffer overflow, and that's bad, right? So you throw stuff in there, and as long as it's not full, you're good. As soon as it's full, you gotta wait until the printer has printed stuff, and then you can throw more stuff in there. This is basically the what problem. Producer consumer problem, right? That's why we studied it about a month ago. Um, and so all of these devices that have uneven speeds um, pretty much have to deal with this um, buffering uh, producer consumer. So, uh, now one of the nice things is um, if you only had a single character at a time, and you didn't have a buffer, then you'd have to wait after every single buffer. Um, if you can have every single call. If you have a buffer, then you just wait at the beginning, and then you wait at the end, like if it gets full or if it gets empty. Those are the only two times you have to use the, the weights. So it's a lot more uh, efficient to do that. But, uh, and again, you have choices. Are you going to buffer in the user space? Are you going to buffer in the kernel space? Okay. Um, are you actually going to buffer in the device itself? Now, what's if you only buffer in the user space, what's a disadvantage? Anytime you do something in the user space, what's one of the disadvantages? User space. Okay. Um, yeah, the user has to take care of all this stuff, right? He has to take care of the producer consumer. You can encapsulate and shut down the operating system, right? And so, I mean, how many people of y'all, how many of y'all when you're programming a print go, oh, wait a minute, is the, you know, is the, is the printer in a ready state or a waiting state? And now I can ship, you know, I can print another line and now let me check and see if it's ready or waiting. Do we have to do any of that? No. Because they've shut it all down in the kernel, right? The kernel takes care of the print spooler, takes care of all that. Um, so typically you're gonna go ahead and put that down in the kernel space. And then, again, if we, go a little bit further and say, hey, there's a buffer in my printer. And y'all see that they've got lots of time memory in the printer, so you can screw it all up to the printer, and it starts doing its thing. Well, the problem is, now how many copies do we have in the data? We've got one at the user space, and one at the kernel space, and one at the device, so it's not necessarily as efficient as it could be for space, right? Okay, um, so without any buffering, um, we're inefficient. If we have lots and lots of buffering, then potentially we have uh, used a lot more resources. All right, well, sometimes um, a single buffer is not enough. So you can go ahead and do double buffering. Um, and we can go ahead and start filling this one out. Can we fill that one out? We can go to here. I'm not gonna be too worried about that. Again, the downside is the more copies you have, um, potentially the more resources you can use. All right, so what we skipped earlier was the whole idea of RAID, okay? Since disks are fairly inexpensive. I mean, you get what, a terabyte disk for 30 bucks now? Um, you can go ahead and have multiple disks so that when you're writing stuff, you make copies to it. And then now you have, uh, especially if the writes are in parallel, you can write just as fast to two as you can write to one. And now you have a lot more stable, uh, well, less chance of an error. Now, um, basically, read one was just you have multiple disks and they're exact copies. Uh, RAID pretty much has two advantages. One, you've got your parallel access, and two is redundancy. So 
if something bad happens, boom, you can, you can go ahead and read that. Uh, now, one of the problems is, uh, if you do have multiple disk failures, you can still have problems. So rate zero, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and distribute the information across several drives. So I'm gonna put my, um, let's say I have 11 pieces of information. I'm gonna put some, you know, strip one, you know, track one, sector one, whatever, on this disk, sector two on this disk, sector three on this disk. And that way, um, I've got my data spread out over multiple disks. So if one disk fails, it only affects one fraction of my data, right? It doesn't affect everything. So that's rate zero. Um, but still, the problem is, if one of the disks goes down, I have problems. I, I've still lost a quarter of my data. I've lost everything, so I've lost a quarter of it. So that was rate zero. Um, rate one says, oh, okay, no, 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 we're gonna spread things out over multiple drives, but we're also gonna have copies of multiple drives. <clears throat> so if one disk goes down, that's okay because we have an exact duplicate of it on another disk, right? So we're less likely for a file to die because we have more disks and we've got copies of every disk. What's the obvious bad thing about this? We need a lot more resources. We need a lot more resources, therefore it's a lot more expensive, right? So somebody came up with, well, wait a minute. Um, that's rate one. Rate two. Uh, what if we went ahead and said, okay, we're going to just put the bits. So I'm going to put the first bit of here, the second bit here, third bit here, fourth bit, five, fifth bit over here. Well, what do we know with ECCs if one bit goes bad? The error detection and correction, you know, you can actually say, oh, I know there's an error and I know how to fix it, right? As long as only one disk goes bad. I can still fix it. Now, two disks go bad at the same time, we're still sunk, right? So this one's better in that you need fewer disks, and with those ECCs, you can go ahead and um, figure out this. Now, where are we storing the ECC? Well, potentially we could have the ECC on that eighth disk, right? So we had to add one extra disk, not twice as many extra. So, um, so that was basically the idea of rate three. We're going to add one extra disk, and it's going to be the parity of this. So now we can pull everything back, everything's good. So what's the obvious problem with this one? If I have this two go out, can we recover? If we have, if we have this bit go out, can we recover? Yeah, because we have the parity, right? So if this bit goes out, we're cool. What happens if this one goes out? Actually, we're still okay, because we have our original data. We can just recalculate the parity here, right? So we're still okay. Uh, anyways, so we can go on from there. Well, then they said, well, you know, we still have all our parity in the first one on one disk. What if we went ahead and spread out our parity bits? So now we're less likely, because remember, if the parity disk went out, we have to redo everything, right? So if we spread it out, well now we only lose a little bit of the parity. And you can see, they just keep going. At you know, each step, they're like, ooh, but wait a minute, what if we did this, and what if we did that? Um, so here, what they did is they said, well, what if we, if we have a problem with the parity, then that can be bad, but how do we know if we have a problem with the parity? Because let's say we have a strip 0, 1, 2, and we've got the parity, and the parity doesn't match. Well, was the problem in that this one was wrong, therefore the parity didn't match, or the parity went wrong? How do we know which one's wrong? 
what we can do is we have a copy of the pair. So we have our data, and then we have two copies of the pair. Well, the data doesn't match this parity. Well, maybe the data may be a parity, but if it doesn't match this parity, you know, these two match, then we know the parity is right. It's the problem over here. So, like, okay, now we're going to have a parity one and a parity two for a parity promise. And it goes on and on. Basically, there are really, really creative people out there going, it's super important that our IRS database doesn't go down. How do we protect it, you know? And how do we do it efficiently? And how do we do it so that it's inexpensive? So basically, there's lots of different rate technologies out there. Uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six. The first one was, uh, you just scripted. Um, and basically, you only need index. If you did the varying, now you need two times index. Okay, it means the exact copy of it. Here, with the hand codes, the uh, secret redundancy codes, you needed um, N plus M, okay, and M depended on the handing code. Um, then in a reading, parity, you only need one disk, that extra parity disk, okay. Now, but the problem is that that one parity disk goes bad, there's a little song. Uh, or you don't even know, well, was it the parity disk that went bad or the fifth that went bad? So now you can start doing interleaving, so you spread that risk out over all of them. Or you can actually do the um, distributed dual parity. So I've got two parities, so I can compare the parities to make sure the parity is not wrong. And I can compare the code to the parity to make sure it actually fits. So, this is the other one I would take a picture of. Now, I'm probably not going to go into the crazy details of, okay, so what is the this or that? But if you know the idea of if something goes wrong, what do I do? Okay, I can have a copy of this. I can have parity bits. I can distribute things across multiple disks to reduce my risk. You know those kind of things, that's probably good enough. You just need to know the concepts. I'm not going to say, well, there's this, a rating three or a rating seven. You just need to know the rough concepts. <sighs> All right, so we talked about this movement. Formatting. Okay, go back to that preamble again. Remember when we're marking sectors? Okay. We can say, hey, this sector is bad. And one of the things in that preamble was which sector number. And we said, well, you know, we always know this is sector one. Well, maybe we're skewed. Or maybe that sector's gone bad. Well, when we copied it over here, now the preamble says this is sector two. We thought it might be here, or we thought it might be here because of bad sectors. It may actually be over here. So that's why every single sector says, hey, I'm sector 77. You know, it seemed redundant initially, but because of bad sectors, that's one of the reasons that it's bad. Because of skew and bad sectors. <clears throat> awesome. Okay, so at this point, are there questions? on the homework, the project, anything? Yes. So the first time you read it, you're gonna get your CD. The next time you read it, you're gonna get your C colon slash temp. Now, if I did something like temp space files, not a but temp space files, is that gonna cause a problem? Yeah, because you're going to read your first one, hey, this is the command I'm working on. You're going to read your next one, it's not going to read that. That's why in the example it says, hey, don't use spaces in your file names. So you don't have to deal with this whole business here. Uh, so at that point, it's going to go ahead and do the change directory to SQL and slash temp. 
let's say you do a uh, you know a make directory, where is it going to make that directory? If I've, cur if I've currently done a cd temp and I do a make dir of Eddie, what is that Eddie directory going to be? And SQL and slash temp, right? It's the current directory. Now, options could have been, hey, am I going to allow my make dir to do an absolute so that I can I can actually do a make dir c colon slash test slash eddy instead of temp slash eddy? You get an absolute path, maybe you do a relative path. I want to do a make dir dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot eddy. To make it easy, we're assuming that whatever directory you're currently in, that's where you're doing the make dir. Does that make sense? Now, Several people had problems with this. Um, do y'all want to go ahead and make this do after spring break? Or is everybody pretty much ready? 